Welcome to the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the third quarter of 2023. Lesson 13 from the book of Ephesians is titled Waging Peace. It's ready for teaching on September 23. The author is John McVeigh and your reader today is Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, September 16. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that as we're studying these lessons and we're reading in Ephesians and we're reading in Revelation about war, about standing firm, we also learn that peace is what really occurs when we get to know you, when we serve you. And that peace we can have for ourselves regardless of where our situation is, whether life is difficult, whether the surroundings we're in are tormenting us. Lord, we just know that we can have peace with you and that is found when we come to you in prayer and when we delve into your word. And Lord, we pray that as we study your word this week that your Holy Spirit will guide us, that our hearts may be cheered and that our faith may be stronger and that the grace we receive from you may be evident. And may we show that grace to those around us. And today I'd like to pray for listeners who've contacted us I'd like to pray for Malimo Habwingo in Zambia and also in Zambia, Abia Mafwemba and Ilia Kendall in Trinidad, Jose Marcus and Jane Marcus, both from Brazil, not sure if they're related, Lord, Dolores Ocampo from Las Vegas, Barbara in Cuba uh, from Africa, uh, Derek Fowler, Mara Francis and Joan Skinner from Snowshoe in West Virginia, Betty Day in Garoka, Papua New Guinea, a university student there, and Zayam, Zainab Yate from Sierra Leone. And Lord, it's the first time we've had someone contact us from Sierra Leone, but I'm sure there are thousands listening there, understanding that your word is so precious in our lives that we should turn to it every day. Now, Lord, shut us in with you as we open your word. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 16. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Let's read that again. Ephesians six sixteen and 17. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. In John Bunyan's devotional classic, The Pilgrim's Progress, written while he was in jail, Christian is escorted into a palace armoury and shown all manner of furniture or weaponry which their Lord had provided for pilgrims as sword, shield, helmet, breastplate, all prayer, and shoes that would not wear out. And there were enough of this to fit out as many men for the service of the Lord as there be stars in the heaven for multitude. Before Christian departs, he is again escorted into the armory, where they fitted him from head to foot with what was of impenetrable, lest perhaps he should meet with assaults in the way. Bunyan's writing in 1678 recalls a document written some 1600 years earlier by the Apostle Paul, the Epistle to the Ephesians, also composed in prison. In it, the great missionary apostle imagines a great army, the church, visiting God's armory and suiting up in the divine panoplia, the Greek term for full head-to-toe armour. God's armoury holds enough of the finest weaponry for every soldier in his army to be clad with northern steel from top to toe as they set forth to wage peace in his name. Sunday, September 17. The Church, a Unified Army. Read Ephesians 6, 10-20. What is Paul saying about the kind of warfare the church is engaged in? 
Is Paul primarily depicting just an individual believer's spiritual battle against evil, or the church's corporate war against evil? Let's read Ephesians 6, verses 10 to 20. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armour of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armour of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints, and for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak." Victory in Greek and Roman warfare was dependent on the cooperation of the soldiers in a military unit and especially in their support for each other in the heat of battle. Individualism in battle was regarded as a characteristic of barbarian warriors, dooming them to defeat. There are important reasons to support the idea that Paul, in line with this usual military understanding, is primarily addressing the church's shared battle against evil in Ephesians 6, verses 10 to 20. 1. The passage is the climax of a letter that is all about the church. It would be strange for Paul to conclude his letter with a picture of a lone Christian warrior doing battle against the foes of darkness. 2. At the end of the passage, Paul highlights Christian camaraderie in his call to prayer for all the saints in verses 18 to 20. 3. Most significant of all, earlier in the letter, when Paul discusses the powers of evil, he places them over against the church, not the individual believer. Verse 10 in chapter 3, so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Thus, Ephesians 6, 10-20 does not portray a solitary lone warrior confronting evil. Instead, Paul, as a general, addresses the church as an army. He calls us to take up our full armour and, as a unified army, vigorously and unitedly press the battle. Paul chooses to conclude his thoroughgoing emphasis on the church which has included sustained descriptions of the church as the body of Christ in Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, and he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all, and also in Ephesians 4, 1 to 16, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavouring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in you all. But to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this he ascended, what does it mean but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. 
And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men, in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. And then the building temple of God, Ephesians 2, 19 to 22. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building, being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit." and the Bride of Christ in Ephesians 5, 21-33. Submitting to one another in the fear of God. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the Saviour of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh." This is a great mystery, but I tell you concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. With a final metaphor, the church as the army of the living God. Since we are approaching the evil day, as it says in Ephesians 6.13, the final stages of the long-running battle against evil, it is no time to be fuzzy with our commitment to God or our loyalty to one another as fellow soldiers of Christ. And so to finish today, in what ways can we, as a corporate body, work together in the great controversy in order to help each other in our struggles against evil in whatever form it comes. Monday, September 18. Belt and Breastplate How does Paul imagine believers beginning their preparation for the battle against evil? Well, we've got a few texts to look at here. First of all, Ephesians 6 verse 14, Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 1, Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind, for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. And 1 Peter 5 verse 8, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And Romans 8, verses 37 to 39. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul's warning of an intense battle in Ephesians 6 verse 13 prepares readers for his final call to stand, his fourth. 
And we'll compare some texts here. First of all, Ephesians 6 verse 11, put on the whole armour of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And we compare that with verse 13, therefore take up the whole armour of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. And it's a detailed call to arms, as we read in verses 14 to 17. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of of God. Paul describes the action of girding up one's waist. Here we are referred to Isaiah 11 verse 5, righteousness shall be the belt of his loins and faithfulness the belt of his waist. Ancient loose-fitting garments needed to be tied up around the waist before work or battle. And uh, we've got some comparisons here in Luke 12, verse 35. Let your waist be girded and your lamps burning. And verse 37. Blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find them watching. Assuredly, I say to you that he will gird himself and have them sit down to eat and will come and serve them. And Luke 17, verse 8. But will he not rather say to him, prepare something for my supper and gird yourself and serve me till I have eaten and drunk, and afterward you will eat and drink? Paul imagines the believer suiting up in armour as would a Roman legionnaire, beginning with the leather military belt with its decorative belt plates and buckle. From the belt hung a number of leather straps covered with metal discs, together forming an apron worn as a badge of rank for visual effect. It served the essential function of tying up the garments and holding other items in place. Truth is not the believer's own. It is a gift of God. Compare salvation in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. It is not, though, to remain abstract, a distant asset without any transforming impact on their lives. They are to put on God's truth, to experience and use this divine gift. They do not so much possess God's truth as God's truth possesses and protects them. Paul next urges believers to put on the breastplate of righteousness in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 8. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Like the belt of truth, it is of divine origin, being part of the armour of Yahweh in his role as the divine warrior. As we read in Isaiah 59 verse 17, For he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a cloak. The body armour used by soldiers in Paul's day was made of mail, that's small intertwined iron rings, scale armour, small overlapping scales of bronze or iron, or bands of overlapping iron fastened together. This body armour or breastplate protected the vital organs from the blows and thrusts of the enemy. In an analogous way, believers are to experience the spiritual protection offered by God's protective gift of righteousness. In Ephesians, Paul associates righteousness with holiness, goodness and truth. And we read in Ephesians 4 verse 24, And that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness... And Ephesians 5 verse 8, For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness and truth. Thinking of it as the quality of treating others justly and well, especially fellow church members. And so to finish today, in what ways have you experienced the idea that goodness, holiness and truth can be a protection?
Tuesday, September 19, Shoes, the Church Wages Peace A Roman soldier preparing for battle would tie on a pair of sturdy military sandals. A multi-layered sole featuring rugged hobnails helped the soldier hold his ground and stand. As we read in Ephesians 6 verse 11, Put on the whole armour of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And verse 13, Therefore take up the whole armour of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. And verse 14, Stand therefore having girded your waist with truth Truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Paul explains this military footwear with language from Isaiah 52 verse 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who proclaims peace, who brings glad tidings of good things, who proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns which celebrates the moment when a messenger brings the news that Yahweh's battle on behalf of his people is won, as we read in verses 8 to 10 of Isaiah 52. Your watchmen shall lift up their voices, with their voices they shall sing together, for they shall see eye to eye when the Lord brings back Zion. Break forth into joy, sing together, you waste places of Jerusalem, For the Lord has comforted his people, he has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. And peace now reigns. Isaiah 52, 7 says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace. Review the eight times Paul highlights peace in Ephesians. Why does he use a detailed military metaphor when he is so interested in peace? We start with Ephesians 1 verse 2, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then Ephesians 2 verse 14, For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. And verse 15, Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two thus making peace. And verse 17, And he came and preached peace to you, who were afar off, and to those who were near. And chapter 4, verse 3, endeavouring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And then Ephesians 6, verse 15, And having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And verse 23, Peace to you, brethren, and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul celebrates peace as the work of Christ, our peace, the one who preaches peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. We read in Ephesians 2, 14 to 17, drawing Jew and Gentile together into one new humanity, as it says in the NIV for Ephesians 2, 15. By keeping alive the gospel story of Christ's rescue and his creative work of peace, by celebrating his victory past and looking toward the victory shout in the future, believers shod their feet and stand ready for battle. Like the messenger in Isaiah 52, 7, believers are messengers proclaiming the victory of Christ and his peace. Paul, however, does not wish us to understand his call to arms as a call to take up military weapons against our enemies. That's why he describes believers as proclaiming the gospel of peace in Ephesians 6 verse 15. Nor does he wish believers to be combative in their relationships with others, since he has been emphasizing unity, edifying speech and tender-heartedness. We're going to especially look at Ephesians 4, 25 to 5, verse 2, and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. 
Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbour, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labour, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamour, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. The church is to wage peace by employing the gospel arsenal of Christian virtues, humility, patience, forgiveness, etc., and practices, prayer, worship. Such acts are strategic, pointing toward God's grand plan to unify all things in Christ, as we read in Ephesians 1, verses 9 and 10, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, in him. And so to finish the day, How does the following quote help us understand what Paul's military imagery should mean in our lives as believers? Ellen White writes in the Australasian Union Conference Record of July 28, 1899, God calls upon us to put on the armour. We do not want Saul's armour, but the whole armour of God. Then we can go forth to the work with hearts full of Christ-like tenderness, compassion and love. Wednesday, September 20, Shield, Helmet and Sword When and how should believers as combatants in the great controversy use the shield, the helmet and the sword? Let's look at Ephesians chapter 6, verses 16 and 17. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Paul's shield is the large rectangular shield of a Roman legionnaire. Made with wood and covered with leather, its edges curved inwards to guard against attacks from the side. When soaked in water, shields were able to quench fiery darts, extinguishing arrows dipped in pitch and set on fire. Paul's description of the shield of faith reflects the Old Testament use of the shield as a symbol of God who protects his people, as we read in Genesis 15.1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram, I am your shield, your exceeding great reward. And also Psalm 3, verse 3, But you, O Lord, are a shield for me, my glory and the one who lifts up my head. To take up the shield of faith, as we read in verse 16, is to enter the cosmic battle with confidence in God, who fights on behalf of believers, as we read in Ephesians 6.10, and it supplies the finest weaponry, as we read in verses 11 and 13, and who ensures victory. At the same time, the Roman battle helmet was made of iron or bronze. To the bowl that protected the head were added a plate at the back to guard the neck, ear guards, a brow ridge, and hinged plates to protect the cheeks. 
Given the essential protection the helmet provided, the helmet of salvation, as in chapter 6, verse 17, symbolizes the present salvation believers experience in solidarity with the resurrected, ascended, and exalted Christ, as we read in Ephesians 2, 6-10, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that, in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them." To put on the helmet of salvation means to reject the fear of spiritual powers so common in the time and instead to trust in the supreme power of Christ. And here we compare Ephesians 1, 15 to 23 and Ephesians 2, 1 to 10. First of all, Ephesians 1, beginning at verse 15. Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead, and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet, and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And we're also comparing Ephesians 2, 1 to 10. And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sin, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others." But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any one should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The final item of armour is the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, which read in Ephesians 6.17, referring to the Roman legionnaire's short, two-edged sword. The usual battle tactic was to throw two javelins, not mentioned by Paul, and then draw the sword and charge, employing the short sword in a thrusting motion. The believer's sword is the sword of the Spirit, in that it is supplied by the Spirit, a weapon identified as the Word of God. Paul steps forward as general and issues a call to arms, speaking promises of hope and victory from the divine commander-in-chief. It is these promises issued in Ephesians 6, 10-20 that constitute the word of God as the lead weapon in the battle against evil. The word of God then refers to the broad promises of the gospel that we find in the Bible. And so to finish the day, even if we might not like so many military images, 
What should this imagery teach us about just how literal the great controversy really is and how seriously we should take it? Thursday, September 21, Practicing Battlefield Prayer In concluding his battle exhortation, Paul urges believers as soldiers to participate in crucial continuing prayer, as he says in chapter 6, verse 18 of Ephesians, for all the saints, and for himself as imprisoned ambassador in Ephesians 6, verses 19 and 20. This call to prayer can be seen as an extension of the military imagery since calling out to God or to the gods in prayer was a common practice on the ancient battlefield. To cite a biblical example, following the battle exhortation of Jehaziel, Jehoshaphat leads all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem in falling down before the Lord, worshipping the Lord. That's 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 18. While prayer is not a seventh piece of armour, it is an integral part of Paul's battle exhortation and military metaphor. In the first of two prayer requests, Paul asks the addressees to participate in fervent, urgent and perseverant prayer for all the saints in Ephesians 6.18. If the church is to be successful in its battle against the powers of evil, it will need to practice dependence on God through spirit-inspired prayer. Paul's second prayer request is for himself. And also for me, he says in verse 19. He asks for prayer that God may grant him the right message, that words may be given to me at the right time in opening my mouth, delivered in the right way, boldly to proclaim, and addressing a most important theme, the mystery of the gospel in verse 19. This last phrase refers to what we might call the open secret of God's intervention in Christ to redeem Gentiles along with the Jews, creating one new humanity, also as a signal of the overarching plan to unite all things in Christ. And we look at a few verses here. First of all, we look at Ephesians 3, verses 1 to 13. For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel, of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the Church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. Therefore I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is his glory. And Ephesians 2, verses 11 to 22. Therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, 
having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who were near. For through him we both have access by one Spirit to the Father. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building, being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Review the following calls to prayer in the New Testament. Which one inspires you the most? Luke 18, verses 1 to 8. Then he spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart, saying, There was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. Now there was a widow in that city, and she came to him, saying, Get justice for me from my adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she wearies me. Then the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said. And shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? And Philippians chapter 4 verse 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and Colossians chapter 4 and verse 2. Continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. And 1 Thessalonians five sixteen to 18. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Why are believers so often urged to participate in earnest, persevering prayer? Paul's military metaphor suggests two answers. One, the threat of spiritual battle against an array of supernatural enemies is dire and real. And two, God's promises of spiritual strength and victory are illustrated through Paul's military imagery in Ephesians 6, 10-17. Earnest, persevering prayer provides opportunity for us to listen carefully to these promises, to celebrate them, and to thank God for the resources of His grace. Friday, September 22. An army in battle would become confused and weakened unless all worked in concert. Ellen White writes in the Spaulding and Megan collection, page 121. She continues, If the soldiers should act out their own impulsive ideas, without reference to each other's positions and work, they would be a collection of independent atoms. They could not do the work of an organised body. So, the soldiers of Christ must act in harmony. They alone must not be cherished. If they do this, the Lord's people in the place of being in perfect harmony of one mind, one purpose and consecrated to one grand object will find efforts fruitless, their time and capabilities wasted. Union is strength. A few converted souls acting in harmony, acting for one grand purpose under one head will achieve victories at every encounter. End of quote. What is the significance of Paul's labelling himself an ambassador in chains in Ephesians 6 verse 20? Ambassadors often played challenging roles during wartime, writes David J. Williams in Paul's Metaphors, Their Context and Character, page 152. So, 
Paul's self-description fits the context of his military metaphor. Ambassadors were to be treated with the respect due to the person or country that sent them. So, there is stark contrast between Paul's status as ambassador for the supreme ruler of the cosmos and the utter disrespect signalled by his chains, literally, chain. However, since ambassadors would wear a chain of office, Paul's mention of a chain may be spiced with irony, in which he sees his chain as a decoration to be worn with distinction. End of quote. And that brings us to our four discussion questions for this week. 1. In your corner of a world divided and at war, what does it mean for you and your congregation to wage peace? How can we be agents of peace in a world so increasingly characterised by aggression and violence? 2. What particular fiery darts are being hurled in your direction? How can you ensure that the shield of faith is in place to extinguish them? 3. We sometimes speak of prayer warriors. How might we conduct prayer ministry based on Ephesians 6, 18-20? Let's have a look at that. Beginning at verse 18, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints, and for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I might speak boldly as I ought to speak. And four, how should we treat those who are wounded on the battlefield of the great controversy? How should we treat the Christian believer who, in the heat of the battle, flees out of fear or openly capitulates to the other side? And today's lesson marks the final Sabbath of the big camp meeting held by the South Queensland Conference just north of Brisbane in Queensland, Australia. I'll be running the big camp radio, broadcasting all of the meetings from the big tent. By big tent, I mean a big tent. It has eight or nine poles. That is a massive tent. And with thousands of people attending, uh, it is a marvellous affair of faith. Well, if you are able to go to the website for the South Queensland Conference Big Camp, you may be able to find Big Camp Radio and listen in yourself. Of course, if you are on the ground, come and see me at the radio booth. And now it's time for Inside Story with Sibylla. Thank you, Sibylla. Power of a Few Words by Andrew McChesney When armed conflict erupted in his homeland of Ukraine in 2022, Alexei Arishanyan was living safely across the border in Poland, where he had worked for several years installing windows in people's homes. But he had many relatives in Ukraine and he was worried about them. He called relative after relative to check on their well-being and to see if he could help. How are you, Aunt Ludia? he asked. All is fine, praise God, she replied. We are in hiding. She said her daughter Nastya and her young son were planning to join refugees spilling across the border to Poland. During normal times, the trip would have taken a day, but now the trip would take two to three days. Will they come to Warsaw? Alexei asked. Have them call me. They can stay with me as long as they need. I can meet them at the border. A short time later, another relative called from Ukraine to say that Nastya and her son were already in Poland. They had crossed the border and were staying with a Polish family who had opened their home to them. Many Polish people generously offered temporary housing to refugees. Alexei called Nastya and promised to come for her and her son. She and her son were waiting when Alexei drove up to the house. The 60-year-old owner of the house accompanied Nastya and her son to the car. Nastya waved goodbye as she got into the car, and Alexei opened the car trunk to place her and her son's belongings inside. As the trunk lid opened, he saw several copies of Ellen White's The Great Controversy inside. Alexei belonged to a church group that distributed the book, 
a difficult task with few receptive people, and he always kept several books in the trunk. Alexei grabbed a book. I have a gift for you, he told the 60-year-old man. What kind of gift? the man asked curiously. It's a Christian book that contains the history of Christianity from the first Christians who defended the truth after Christ returned to heaven to the events that will occur at the end of the world, Alexei said. I think that you will find it interesting. The man accepted the book and then he gave Alexei a big hug. Thank you, he said. Alexei was overjoyed. He had not expected to, it to be so easy. This was the will of God, he says. All I have to do was say a few words and he took the book. I pray that he reads it and that his wife and children read it too. I hope that he accepts it. This quarter's 13th Sabbath offering will go to the Trans-European Division, which includes Poland. Thank you for planning a generous offering next Sabbath. Greetings, Sabbath School friends around the world. My name is Emma Garrick, a final year nursing student at Avondale University in Coorumbong, Australia. You have been listening to my grandfather, Percy Harold, reading the text of the Adult Bible Study Guide with this week's Sabbath School lesson. He has been doing this for free since 1996, long before I was born. Initially read as Eyes for the Visually Impaired through Christian Services for the Blind in Australia and New Zealand, it became a podcast in July 2007 and so became available to anyone around the world. In 2021, Pa's podcast became the reading podcast for the official General Conference Sabbath School app with daily recordings of each day of the lesson. The podcast of the reading of the Sabbath School lessons are available from Hope Channel Australia, primarily on SoundCloud, and thence on multiple podcast rebroadcasters, including Apple iTunes. For several years, it has also been available in YouTube format, with the voice of my grandfather syncing in time with the scrolling of the text of the lesson, including all the reference texts. And for the visually impaired in the North American division, it is available on CD from Christian Record Services out of Nebraska. Hope Channel Germany distributes it to the blind in Europe. You are over one of 40,000 who listen every week around the globe. Tell your friends to look up my grandfather on the internet. It is simple. Just search for Dr. Percy Harold, select the site you want to listen to, make it a favourite on your device, and be able to listen again anytime you like. But downloading the General Conference Sabbath School app is a sure way to listen daily. That is the one with the blue rectangular icon with a stylized globe and three angels superimposed. And, as my grandfather would say each week, remember, God is always faithful.